If you've been feeling overstressed and burnt out lately, you're not alone, not even close. In fact, according to one yearly poll, 2018 saw Americans reach their highest reported stress levels in over a decade. With talk of stress-related diseases and reports of work-related burnout on the rise, it's no surprise that people are showing an increased interest in herbal supplements, which are said to reduce stress and improve health. While the idea of using herbs as medicine is gaining traction in America, in the rest of the world, this idea never left. Just ask the World Health Organization, who report that 75% of the world's population depend on botanical medicines for their basic healthcare needs. While China and India are some of the largest users of these medicines, herbal medicines are widely used in Europe as well. Take Germany, for example, where they classify medicinal herbs as phytomedicines, all German medical students learn about them and regularly prescribe them to their patients. In this video, we're going to look specifically at adaptogens. This family of herbs are said to carry a wide range of benefits, mostly centering around adapting to stress, supporting metabolic and immune function, and restoring hormonal balance. While many people swear they have seen major improvements to their physical and mental well-being, on this channel, we like to dive a bit deeper. I also want to take a deeper look to really understand and explain our body's physical and mental stress pathways, where they go wrong when we get burnt out, and how adaptogens can help us get back to our best physical and mental performance. Specifically, we'll look into ginseng, ashwagandha, and rhodiola. These adaptogens have received some of the most praise for their supposed benefits on stress, immune function, longevity, mental performance, and even physical performance. So beyond just providing a broad overview of adaptogens, we'll also look at their history and the science-backed benefits behind some of the most well-known ones. I've included time codes for everything on the screen and in the description. So if you only clicked on this video to learn about a specific one of these herbs, you can skip right to it. So the question is, are these claims just hype? Well, the first clue might be just how long people have been using these herbs. The history of humans using these adaptogenic herbs goes back far. While we are going to cover the modern science behind them and the science of stress, let's first investigate what the people who discovered their health benefits thought of them. Thousands of years before Russian scientist Nikolai Lazarev would first coin the term adaptogen to describe the shared properties of these herbs, ancient cultures around the world were already discovering their effects for themselves. If you aren't interested in any of this history, you can skip ahead to the research-backed effects. Personally though, I find the history adds some great context. Take rhodiola for example, with traditional folk uses including increasing physical and mental endurance, improving longevity and immune function, and treating fatigue, depression, and erectile dysfunction to name a few. Its true botanical name is rhodiola rosea, and it belongs to the Crassulaceae family. It is also considered a perennial, meaning the same plant will live for multiple years, flowering each summer. What makes this so impressive though, is rhodiola does this in some of the harshest growing conditions on Earth, found primarily in the northern circumpolar regions. Its ability to endure intense environmental stress will become relevant later. Rhodiola actually originated in the southern Siberian mountains, before spreading far and wide through Iceland, Greenland, northeastern Canada, and even remote areas of northern Russia, where temperatures have been known to fall to a bone-chilling negative 65 degrees Celsius. In mountain villages in Siberia, people began consuming rhodiola thousands of years ago when they discovered it helped to prevent sickness and treat fatigue. To this day, in many of these villages, couples are still given a bouquet of rhodiola roots on their wedding day, owing to the belief that it will enhance fertility. The first written record of its use in medicine is in Dematria Medica, a guidebook of medicinal herbs produced by the Greek physician Dioscorides in the year 77 CE. He wrote that he found it helpful in treating headaches and bruises. Although not native to Greece, the root made such an impression on Greek traders that they brought it back from trading expeditions across the Aegean Sea, which occurred over 1,000 years before Dioscorides. Across the continent, rhodiola was also used in Middle Asia for nearly as long. The Chinese call it Hongjingkin. They viewed it as an effective remedy for cold and flu, 
during the harsh winters of northern China. Its arrival into China is said to have been a result of Chinese emperors searching for the secret to long life, sending envoys to trade with the Siberians for this golden route. Meanwhile, on the other side of the continent, Rhodiola had picked up a very different group of fans, the Vikings, who felt consuming it enhanced their physical and mental endurance. With this history earning it a spot in the first ever Swedish pharmacopedia, published all the way back in 1755. With so many different cultures having rich histories of rhodiola use and all feeling it possessed powerful properties, it's no surprise that it grabbed the attention of 20th century researchers, and what they found is nothing short of incredible. You'll see exactly what I mean soon enough. Without giving too much away, I will say it is one of several adaptogens I take personally. If that means something to you, I'm going to add a link in the description to the adaptogen combo I take, which will include all the adaptogens covered in this video. Asian ginseng is considered by many to be one of the prime examples of an adaptogen. Like rhodiola, it is a perennial, and its usage long predates the use of the term adaptogen. Asian ginseng initially grew in the mountainous forests of eastern Manchuria, northern China, and Korea. So to look at its history of usage, we will focus in on traditional Chinese medicine. The first written record of humans using ginseng appears in the Shenong Bengkao Jing, a guide to 252 Chinese herbal remedies, written nearly two millennia ago in the year 220 AD. While some Chinese historians believe Asian ginseng was discovered just several hundred years before that in Shangdang, Korean researchers point out that because it started being used so suddenly, it instead may have originated in Korea, as its discovery lines up with the Chinese advance into Korea. Ginseng is now a staple of traditional Chinese medicine. Its Chinese name, Ren Shen, translating literally to man root. As with rhodiola, we will first see what the traditional beliefs around it are, but to best understand the traditional healing beliefs surrounding ginseng, it helps to look at them in the context of traditional Chinese medicine and the unique ways which it defines health. That's because while many might dismiss terms like yin, yang, and qi, and say that they have no place in a science-based video, if you take time to actually understand what these terms meant to the people of the day, you can learn a lot about how they felt ginseng benefited them on a very practical level. I'll show you just what I mean. Recognize this? Yin and yang is a key element of Chinese philosophy. It's the concept of seemingly opposite and competing forces in fact being complementary and often dependent on one another. Within traditional Chinese medicine, organs of the body are held to have either yin or yang properties as well. In the Shenang Bengkao Jing, published over 2000 years ago, it's written that ginseng supplements the yin organs, which includes the liver, heart, spleen, lungs, and kidneys. Yin organs are believed to produce and store blood, bodily fluids, and qi. So while simply saying that they felt their yin was being nourished may not mean much to a lot of us, feeling that their lungs were stronger and their heart was pumping better might really mean that they felt like they had improved energy, lung capacity, and endurance. Also, yin organs are said to be responsible for qi, Qi is often literally translated to mean energy, so could that mean a reduction in fatigue? Well, just wait till you see what the modern research has found. But first, ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is the third and final adaptogenic herb I want to introduce you to before we move on to the science of what makes you stressed out and the modern evidence behind how these herbs can make a meaningful improvement. I've chosen ashwagandha for several reasons. For one thing, it's a powerful adaptogen which, like the previous two, I do take myself. It has some very interesting effects on mood and physical strength, working a little differently than most adaptogens, instead being said to offer calming properties versus Asian ginseng which is usually associated with increased alertness more than calmness. Also though, since we covered ginseng which over 2000 years had to beat out over 5000 herbs used in traditional Chinese medicine to earn its place near the top, within the ancient medical traditions of India, ashwagandha has achieved something similar, rising to prominence over thousands of herbs to be named one of the most important herbs of Ayurveda. So ashwagandha is here in a sense to represent India's answer to the Chinese's ginseng. It's even sometimes called Indian ginseng. Ashwagandha, which is often referred to by its botanical name Withenia somnifera, like the others, is a perennial, with a hardy root. Ashwagandha grows in the hotter and drier subtropical regions of India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and parts of Africa. 
While it doesn't need to endure extreme cold like the others, it has to be incredibly hardy against the multitude of pests which attack it, including funguses and insects. Ayurveda, the traditional system of medicine practiced in India, can be traced back to 6000 BC, and ashwagandha usage dates back nearly as long. Ashwagandha, or as my Indian bros may call it by its Hindi name, Asgandha, is primarily seen as a Rasayana, which means they believe it has the ability to prolong life, promoting a youthful state of physical and mental health while expanding happiness. Ayurvedic medicine also classifies it as Bala, signifying a belief it increases strength and endurance, and as Vajakara, which makes something an aphrodisiac, leading to the belief that ashwagandha can improve sexual function. Interestingly, completely independently, African tribes began using it as a libido booster, as well as an immune system booster to help treat cold and flu. So it was, for thousands of years, these herbs existed within the medicine of their respective cultures, with significant overlap in their uses, revolving around enhancing health and immune system function, restoring energy levels, improving cognition, and offering general performance benefits. It isn't surprising that eventually someone would take notice of these shared properties and traverse cultural boundaries to pick them out and categorize them together as one class of performance-enhancing herbs. Leave it to the Russians to be those people. In the 1940s, the USSR, in their endless pursuit of total dominance, ordered the Soviet Academy of Science to develop a product that would increase the performance of their elite personnel and athletes. To achieve this, the term adaptogen was developed by Soviet scientist, medical doctor, and pharmacologist Nikolai Lazarev to describe substances that increase the body's non-specific resistance to stress. Now, stress can include everything from the physical stress of a workout to the mental stress of work or the biological stress of being sick. Because as we will see, though so different, all stressors activate the same part of the brain and the same stress pathway. Initially, Nikolai looked to synthetic substances. It wasn't until his colleague, Israel Burkham, realized that they were looking in the wrong place. While synthetic stimulants could provide a huge burst of energy, they saw in World War II soldiers given amphetamines that over the long term, they tended to be counterproductive and lead to burnout. Burkham realized that the key might instead lay not in the lab, but in nature, and the traditional herbs which we now know as adaptogens. First, they came upon Asian ginseng, but there was a problem. It wasn't found in Russia and was expensive to import. So for much of their early research, they would instead use Eleutherococcus centicosis, which is often referred to as Siberian ginseng and shares many properties with Asian ginseng. Their first research paper, which was published in 1960, had a huge impact on the field. Two years later, extract of Siberian ginseng was approved by the USSR Ministry of Health to be sold as a new type of stimulant. With the backing of the central government, a study on the Soviet Olympic team showed improved stamina and recovery, increased oxygen intake, and better performance. Followed by a study on 1,000 Siberian miners, which found that the incidence of cases during the influenza epidemic of the year dropped by nearly two-thirds in miners who consumed Eleutherococcus centicosis. As their research into adaptogens continued, they searched for new herbs to study. To fit their criteria as an adaptogen, a herb had to be absolutely safe with no side effects, especially when used long-term. It had to have a broadly positive impact on the body and have a normalizing effect. This definition still stands today, with researchers around the world joining the hunt leaving us now with a solid list of well-researched adaptogenic herbs. Let's now look at some of these modern studies, because along with their ability to help you adapt to general stress, research has also shown that many of these adaptogens possess unique benefits also. Starting with Panax ginseng, one of the most popular benefits of ginseng is a supposed decrease in fatigue and an enhancement of mental performance. To investigate this, let's look at a research study published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology Researchers gathered a group of male and female undergraduate students and gave them a series of tests designed to test their cognitive ability. These tests would be done one after another. They also recorded their self-reported fatigue after each test. The students would be required to attend a practice day and then three study days. On each respective study day, they would be given either four placebo pills, 
four pills amounting to 200 mg of ginseng, or four pills totaling 400 mg of ginseng. This way, researchers could compare their performance on the same series of tasks across the three different days and three different intake levels, as well as check for differences in their feelings of fatigue. When it came time to check the data, something jumped out. The days the subjects consumed the 200 and 400 milligrams of ginseng, they reported significantly less fatigue after the tests than they did on the day they consumed the placebo. With each task they had to do, fatigue naturally increased across the three different dosage groups. But when they took ginseng, the increase was lesser, sticking closer to the baseline. Now, what about their performance on the tasks? Well, on the two easier tasks, the difference wasn't statistically significant. For the hardest task though, the Serial 7 subtraction test, which tested their ability to do rapid mental math, the difference with the ginseng was significant. Versus baseline, they were getting significantly more correct answers. So during this study, they found evidence to support ginseng's fatigue beating effects. That's not all though. The researchers also measured for evidence behind another claim often made in relation to ginseng, and that's its ability to help reduce blood sugar. Sure enough, mid-test and post-test blood sugar results in the subjects on the days they consumed the ginseng dropped significantly, with the greatest drop seen post-test in the highest dosage group. I'll get to why this was in a moment. While more human studies have found similar results with improvements in mood, fatigue, and cognitive ability, there are also studies which have found no significant differences, and many more where there are positive differences with ginseng, but it doesn't reach the level of statistical significance. So personally, I'd like to see more research conducted on these topics, with an emphasis on larger sample sizes before we can say it's definitively proven. Another interesting study on mice, which were supplemented with ginseng extracts, tested their physical endurance and found that they were able to outperform their unsupplemented counterparts on a forced swim test. The forced swim test is considered an effective way to measure fatigue in animals. Mice are put into a water container, which they can't escape from. Researchers measure the amount of time they spend attempting to get out versus just aimlessly floating over a six minute period. They use this test to evaluate the effectiveness of various antidepressants. If the mice spend more time trying to get out, it shows increased energy and determination. In the study, the unsupplemented mice spent on average more than 225 seconds of the six minute session simply floating. The mice which consumed the ginseng polysaccharides though, spent significantly more time trying to escape. With a difference of time spent trying to escape, of about 30 seconds in the highest dosed group. Not surprisingly, mice that did the swim test had reduced blood glucose levels after the test, including mice that didn't even get the ginseng, which makes sense since they were exercising after all. What's more interesting though, is that levels of triglycerides in the blood were significantly lower after the swim, only in the mice which consumed ginseng polysaccharides. Triglycerides are essentially the fat which circulates in the blood to be burned as fuel. So lower levels indicate the muscles of the ginseng-fed mice were burning more energy from fat during their exercise. A similar result appeared in a study which had mice exercise for 60 minutes, both with and without ginseng. Mice consuming ginseng burned more energy from fat during the same exercise. So how does this make sense? One study showed blood sugar dropped, but now we are seeing they are also burning more fat. According to some researchers, this is all because ginseng has a glycogen sparing effect, meaning sugar stored in the liver as glycogen is breaking down less rapidly, therefore releasing sugar into the blood more slowly. The liver can store about a thousand calories of energy from carbs you eat as a complex sugar called glycogen. Usually, your body prefers to release this and burn it first over using fat. As a side note, this is one reason why people will often fast or eat in a keto diet low in carbohydrates to deplete their liver's glycogen stores in an effort to maximize their body's usage of fat for energy. Since normally, if the body has glycogen available, pathways activate to limit the body's usage of fat for fuel. This study, which had mice exercise for 60 minutes, showed on closer examination that their livers were breaking down less of this stored sugar, explaining why they were burning more energy from fat and why blood sugar levels 
sometimes fall after ginseng consumption. This is why it should come as no surprise that ginseng appears to activate the AMPK pathway, a longevity pathway which is often referenced as a powerful anti-aging mechanism. AMPK is normally activated when the body has less nutrients available, like when you haven't eaten for a little while. It enhances the ability of muscle cells to take up and burn circulating glucose and triglycerides, which is useful when there are less nutrients circulating. AMPK also promotes autophagy, which is the process where cells respond to reduce nutritional availability by recycling the damaged elements within themselves into new healthy proteins. AMPK is also activated during fasting once glycogen begins to run low. I'm actually not going to go too deep into AMPK and anti-aging here. I'll be making a complete video on anti-aging and longevity soon. For this video, we're going to stick more to the stress pathways. But to summarize the researchers' conclusion, by partially blocking glycogen breakdown into stored sugar, more fat is instead burned. And because cells think there is less energy available, AMPK responds, further enhancing the ability of cells to burn fat and sugar out of the blood. These findings are one of the reasons why ginseng is something I often take when I'm not fasting. If it can truly activate AMPK and keep my body in a state of increased fat burn, as the research suggests, all despite me having glycogen still available and eating carbs, then it's well worth it to me. This effect is why you'll often see it included in pre-workout and fat burning supplements. I personally take my ginseng with a blend of other adaptogens that complement it, like rhodiola, which also seems to have similar effects on glycogen and fat mobilization. Both are included in the blend I take and linked below. Like I said, I want to keep this video more about stress, but I may also make a future video diving deeper into the metabolism boosting effects and mechanisms of herbs like these. On to ashwagandha. Over the past few decades, a huge amount of research has gone into ashwagandha and its effects on muscle, mood, stress hormone levels, and libido. Since I've done an entire video on it already, I'll be keeping it more brief here, but I encourage you to check that out if you want more info. First, let's investigate the claims regarding its impact on muscle. After all, it was classified as bala in traditional Indian medicine, signifying a belief it increases strength. And digging into it, several recent studies actually seem to support this claim. In one of these studies, a group of recreationally active men had their one rep max on the squat and bench press tested to check their strength. In addition, their time to cycle 7.5 kilometers on a stationary bike was also recorded to measure their endurance. They were then divided into two groups. One group would consume 500 milligrams of ashwagandha extract over the duration of the study, while the control group would consume a placebo capsule filled with nothing but rice flour. For 12 weeks, they all followed the same periodized resistance training program, which was designed by a certified strength and conditioning specialist. The weights were set based on their individual one rep maxes to keep it fair. After the 12 weeks, researchers retested to check for improvement. If the claims regarding ashwagandha were true, they would expect the group consuming it to have gained more strength than the group consuming the rice flour. And that's exactly what they found. While the placebo group and the ashwagandha group's one rep max strength on the squat was quite similar towards the start, averaging 103.8 and 105 kilograms respectively, after the 12 weeks, the ashwagandha group's average increase was over 10 kilograms more. The bench press was a similar story. Interestingly, the ashwagandha group's initial numbers were on average several kilograms weaker. By the end though, they were benching more than the placebo group. Their 7.5 kilometer bike times also improved versus the placebo, but the improvement wasn't large enough to be considered statistically significant. I go further into the mechanisms behind how it could be achieving this in my dedicated ashwagandha video. Now, what about the claims regarding improvements in mood and anxiety? Well, it turns out there's been research into these as well. In one study on stress, researchers gathered 64 subjects and put them through three tests designed to measure their state of stress. Then, over 60 days, like with the last study, they would consume either ashwagandha or a placebo. After the 60 days, they administered the tests again and found that on all three, the ashwagandha group improved significantly over the placebo, with improvements in their scores across all the different stress assessment scales. In addition, 
they checked their blood levels for the stress hormone cortisol pre and post test. After 60 days on ashwagandha, serum cortisol levels fell 27.9% from baseline, far more than the 7.9% the placebo group fell by. This unexpectedly reveals a potential explanation for the last study which saw participants on ashwagandha gain more muscle. That's because cortisol, besides being a stress hormone, is well known to work against muscle gain, promoting instead the breakdown of muscle protein. So reduced cortisol would theoretically be putting the body into a more anabolic state. A lot of people also tout the benefits to sexual health of ashwagandha, and for that matter, ginseng as well. A study on ashwagandha in men saw increases in markers of sperm health, while a study in women consuming ashwagandha saw their scores on the female sexual function index increase, with specific increases across several areas of the index. Meanwhile, several studies on ginseng have shown improvements in erection quality and blood flow in men with erectile dysfunction. What about rhodiola, the last of the three adaptogens I wanted to focus in on? Rhodiola has been extensively studied as both a mental and physical performance enhancer. Multiple studies on rhodiola have found it appears to exert an antidepressant effect. In a phase three clinical trial, subjects currently experiencing a mild to moderate bout of depression were recruited to help test these claims. Over the six week trial period, overall depression together with insomnia and emotional instability improved significantly in the subjects receiving rhodiola. Rhodiola's fatigue reducing effects have also been tested on none other than doctors themselves. In a study measuring fatigue during night duty among a group of 56 young, healthy physicians, they measured fatigue using the fatigue index and found a statistically significant improvement in the scores of the rhodiola group. Perhaps one of the most interesting studies relating to rhodiola's mental effects was published in 2000. It focused on international medical students attending Volograd Medical Academy. They tested rhodiola's effect on the students' physical fitness and mental performance during their stressful exam season. While rhodiola reduced fatigue similar to the last study, it also improved fine motor skill as measured by a speed maze test. The most interesting result came after the study though, when the researchers followed up to see how the students actually performed on the exams which were stressing them out. While the average grade in the placebo group was a 3.20, the rhodiola group had them beat, with the group's average grade an impressive 3.47. As many of you know, I co-founded a startup meaning I work long hours and sometimes things can get pretty overwhelming. One of the reasons I added rhodiola into my adaptogen stack. There are also some purported physical benefits beyond fine motor control, but the research can become tricky to navigate. See, back in the 1970s, the Soviet Ministry of Health commissioned extensive testing of rhodiola for their Olympic athletes. On one hand, some preliminary research has stated that rhodiola has anabolic properties, and that it's able to upregulate skeletal muscle protein synthesis. While this could potentially mean improved muscle strength and size over time, it wouldn't necessarily have an immediate performance benefit. I think more research needs to be done to see if this effect is repeatable. As far as exercise performance goes, research is conflicting. While well, a study on mice showed a major improvement in swimming time to exhaustion, with the mice in the rhodiola group able to swim nearly 25% longer, and showing an apparent increase in energy production in their muscles, shown via increased ATP, a detailed study published by the Biosciences and Protection Division of the US Air Force's research laboratory found no improvement in performance. In the study, participants performed wrist curls while a machine was used to monitor the ATP production in their forearm muscles, since enhanced ATP production is a common claim surrounding rhodiola. There was no significant difference between the group that consumed the rhodiola leading up to the test versus the placebo. While certainly thorough, my main gripe with this study is that they only consumed it for three days prior to the test. Even creatine, one of the most studied exercise supplements, can sometimes take weeks of supplementation to reach its peak benefits. So despite all falling into the category of adaptogen, all three of these herbs have their own unique story and effect. Now it's time to get into the ability they all share, which is to help the body adapt to general stress. While we've seen evidence of the effect already, with plenty of studies showing participants do indeed feel less stressed after taking these herbs, 
we still haven't really explained why. I think the best way to approach this is to first investigate the systems in our body which actually cause us to feel stress. By properly uncovering the mechanisms behind the stress response and what can go wrong with it when we get overstressed, we'll be able to actually see the pathways adaptogens must act on. Once we know where to look for their effect, it'll be easier to finally explain it. And once you see how the response works, you'll also be better able to avoid reaching burnout. I'll even cover a couple of additional techniques shown to help alleviate stress beyond adaptogens. To best explain how stress works, I'm going to bring in the work of Dr. Hans Selye, often called the father of modern stress research. His three-phase explanation of how people reach the point of being overstressed turned out to be groundbreaking in the way we understand stress, its purpose, and where it can all go wrong. The first phase is the alarm phase. This occurs when the body recognizes a stressor and results in the release of hormones with physical and mental effects designed to help you beat whatever is stressing you. The hypothalamus is the brain's representative in the three-part hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The HPA is responsible for much of the stress response. It connects the paraventricular nucleus, which can recognize stressors and is located in the hypothalamic region of the brain, with the pituitary and adrenal glands, which have the ability to release powerful stress hormones. These stress hormones are responsible for both the performance-enhancing response to short-term stress, like activation of the fight-or-flight response, and the damaging long-term effects of stress, like reduced muscle mass and anxiety. The HPA axis releases stress hormones through something of a domino effect, each member of the axis releasing hormones which trigger the next. Think of the PVN in the hypothalamus as a command center, constantly monitoring all the physical and psychological triggers of stress. As soon as a stressor is detected, neurons in the PVN sound the alarm, secreting corticotrophin-releasing hormone. CRH is an intermediary stress hormone. It travels to the anterior region of the pituitary gland, triggering the release of adrenocorticotrophic hormone, another stress hormone, into general circulation. ACTH can then travel through the bloodstream to the adrenal glands, where it triggers the release of perhaps the king of all stress hormones, cortisol. While the term stress hormone casts a negative light, the truth is they aren't all bad. Their effects on us are really designed to help us overcome the stressor, and ultimately survive. Adrenaline released during a stress response, for example, causes heart rate and blood pressure increases, packing your muscles and brain with oxygen to help you get away. Cortisol is released in a low-level pattern throughout the day, with the largest daily burst shown to occur in humans like clockwork every morning. This actually helps you wake up, but also could explain why some people feel a little more agitated in the morning. These rhythmic daily secretions of stress hormones trigger receptors in the brain which control your alertness level. Without them, you'd be exhausted all the time. So next time you feel wide awake and full of energy, it's thanks to the normal rhythm of so-called stress hormones triggering the receptors which stimulate brain activity. When suddenly confronted with a stressor though, it becomes a different story. During the alarm phase of the stress response, stress hormone release shoots up far exceeding the standard daily levels necessary to simply keep you awake, focused, and alert. In response to these skyrocketing levels, receptors across the body begin responding at once. Alertness immediately peaks. Also, to increase the energy available for a sudden burst of physical activity, like what might be needed to run away, cortisol begins triggering receptors on muscle cells, activating pathways which break down muscle protein into amino acids, which the liver can convert into extra glucose, spiking blood sugar. The liver is also stimulated to start dumping its own glycogen stores into the bloodstream. This further raises blood sugar to fuel the brain and muscles. These effects combine to put you into an almost superhuman state. This general state of resistance is designed to help you overcome the stressor, no matter what it is. This is considered phase two. These hormones will keep pumping until the PVN stops signaling. With it monitoring so many different things, stressors can also combine in activating the PVN, piling on top of each other, intensifying the response. Ever notice when you're sleep deprived or hungry, small stressors feel more urgent and dangerous? It's because they accumulate. 
all triggering the PVN together at once, magnifying the effect. In order to prevent the stress response from getting out of control, other regions in the brain, like the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, can calm the PVN, acting kind of like a second opinion to help determine whether a stress response is truly necessary. They are able to have this calming effect on PVN activity and reduce stress hormone release in part thanks to the neurotransmitter GABA. Many of the neurons which connect these calming regions of the brain to the PVN use GABA as their primary neurotransmitter. As well, cortisol receptors within the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals also work as a negative feedback mechanism to help keep things in balance. Once you escape the bear or beat the sickness, the PVN stops activating stress signals. CRH release stops, since the pituitary and adrenals can detect that cortisol is still elevated despite the stressor being gone, they immediately stop production to get cortisol back to baseline. However, what if the stressor only gets worse, or new stressors keep piling on, as seems to happen in today's world, such as when you have a demanding job with a barrage of new stressors coming in every single day? That's when we eventually hit phase three, exhaustion. Stress systems being in a constant state of activation results in consistently high levels of cortisol, destroying the typical daily rhythm. Instead of a small burst in the morning to wake you up, with levels just high enough to keep you alert during the day and near zero at night, now levels are elevated all the time. At first, you may actually feel like you have more energy than normal. Higher levels at night will keep your brain more alert you might feel like you need less sleep. It won't be long though before the negative consequences begin catching up and this heightened state of performance plummets into exhaustion and burnout. Remember, cortisol pulls nutrients into the blood in case a quick burst of energy is needed. Elevated cortisol over time though means blood sugar will stay high, a risk factor in developing type 2 diabetes. And the muscle breakdown it causes will also begin to become noticeable and make it harder to gain muscle in the gym, potentially even causing muscle loss. Studies not only confirm that continual stress activations cause baseline daily cortisol levels to rise across the board, blunting out the rhythm, they also reveal something far worse. Without the typical daily rhythm reaching levels near zero at night and giving the receptors a break, now receptors are in a constant state of activation. In response, the glutocorticoid receptors begin down-regulating and disappearing. This is a standard response to a receptor to constant activation. The hope behind this mechanism is that this will restore balance. But with the daily rhythm still blunted out, this down-regulation won't bring back the normal daily cycle. You'll begin to go from feeling constantly high energy to feeling constantly low energy and fatigued. Even the GABA receptors and systems which allow other brain regions to calm the PVN stress response aren't immune to the effects of chronically elevated cortisol and can become dysregulated and less effective. Now, the symptoms associated with burnout make sense. Fatigue, anxiety, depression, weight gain, and muscle loss, all things which accompany overstress, all also related to the overactivation of the stress response. Lazarev and Berkham, the Russian researchers, claimed adaptogens could prolong the duration of the resistance to stress phase and diminish the magnitude of the alarm phase. And sure enough, search the literature and countless researchers have pointed to a calming and balancing effect on the HPA axis as the explanation for how they are able to alleviate general stress. But how exactly are plants able to do all this? What's the mechanism? Well, as it turns out, plants have an incredibly diverse chemical makeup. Hundreds of thousands of primary and secondary metabolites, which are unique chemical compounds, exist within them to do everything from supporting energy generation and storage to providing resistance to environmental stressors, such as the stress of attacking pests or a frigid winter. Two classes of these secondary metabolites have been found to be especially active in humans. Polyphenols, which typically carry antioxidant properties, and terpenes, which generally exist to help the plant survive in its own unique and often harsh environment. Interestingly, these compounds often carry structures very similar to the hormones in our own bodies. In a journal article published to the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, 
Researcher Alexander Penasian points out that because adaptogens may contain thousands of bioactive chemicals, the reductionist approach used to explain a drug action where a single receptor and pathway is activated is insufficient to explain the effects of an adaptogen since they are far more complex and may activate multiple pathways at once. So while there is plenty of evidence that adaptogens can lessen the stress reaction and shift the HPA back into balance, they don't just do it in one way. For example, research on ginseng has found that it contains a special class of metabolites called genocides, and research shows they're able to increase the sensitivity of cortisol receptors, like the ones which are designed to detect when cortisol gets too high, but stop working under chronic stress. In a study on female athletes which logged reductions in their cortisol levels after four weeks of ginseng, researchers pointed to its calming effect on the HPA axis as their explanation. Other researchers have put forth the idea that ginseng is also upregulating GABA, the neurotransmitter which calms the PVN, pointing to evidence in rodents of this effect. A similar enhancement of GABA has been noted by researchers studying ashwagandha, which is one way it could also be suppressing the stress response. The PVN is also sensitive to markers of oxidative stress and inflammation, and will trigger a stress response if it detects them. Both ginseng and ashwagandha have been shown to lower markers of oxidative stress and inflammation. And remember, we've seen firsthand that ashwagandha is able to reduce cortisol levels by nearly 30%. As Panacean emphasized in his paper, what sets adaptogens apart is that they don't just have one mechanism of action, but several, with many more pathways still to be discovered, I'm sure. This is why adaptogens work in contrast to caffeine and other stimulants, which act by actually triggering the release of stress hormones like norepinephrine and cortisol, which we know increases alertness and energy in the short term, but with habitual use, stimulants can lead to burnout. A lot of coffee drinkers keep needing to drink more and more, yet feel more exhausted than ever. Adaptogens like ashwagandha instead lower baseline stress hormone levels as we've seen. Keeping baseline levels low keeps receptors sensitive, enhancing feedback, preventing over-release and eventual exhaustion. I'm also not saying stimulants are bad. I just don't think they should be the only tool in our energy enhancement toolbox. That's why along with my coffee, I'll also take a blend of adaptogens. I used to purchase ashwagandha, rhodiola, and ginseng separately. It can get a bit pricey though if you're like me and prefer to buy from certified manufacturers. I have trust issues, what can I say? Since then, I've started taking a premixed blend, which can be a good value option if you can find one that has everything you want. Just first check that they list their suppliers to be sure of what you're getting. The blend I personally take is premixed and produced by the same site I would get my ashwagandha from. That's actually how I found it and was pleasantly surprised to see it contained everything I was already taking. It has a few extras in it as well, but I checked out the sources and everything seems legit, so I've referenced it in the description if you're looking for a good option. And one last thing, during my research for this video, I also came across another interesting tool to help reduce HPA activation of the stress response. And since I'm not sure when I'll make another video on stress, I wanted to add it in. So it turns out there's a lot of emerging research that social interaction and the resultant release of oxytocin, a hormone released when we spend time with friends and loved ones, is actually able to have a tangible stress dampening effect on the PVN. The two main mechanisms for this appear to be neural priming left over from our childhood, whereby the prefrontal cortex calms the stress response when it detects oxytocin, in the same way a parent's presence will calm a child, as well as the PVN having its own oxytocin receptors, which can calm it. So social interaction, hanging out with friends, it seems it can really make a meaningful difference. And speaking of friends, if you've made it this far and you'd like to be friends with me and keep up with my videos, consider subscribing, or you may never see me again. Also, feel free to follow me on my personal Instagram, shoot me a DM, like all my photos, it's up to you. Some pretty cool uh, raving pictures on there. Hope you enjoyed that video. I know it ran a little long, but when I was doing my research, there was just too much interesting stuff and I wanted to include all of it. So I hope that's okay with you. Um, I'll see you next time. And until next time, D-Man signing off.